Wow. Bringing that nail, we have Professor. Professor Saborna Bari. Professor, how are you, sir? I am very good. Thank you so much for inviting me onto the show. I am so honored to be here on uh, BRT TV. Uh, BRT TV. Well, you know what? I've been trying, sir. I, I, don't, I just don't know how to say it. I've been, I've been, we've been trying to get you for so long, and you have such a hectic schedule. Uh, I, I, we're just so honored that you took time out of your busy schedule, Professor, to hang out with us on a Friday night. Now, I got to ask this question. Oh, you're actually wearing a necktie tonight. Yeah, I, wow. I see he is it up. <laughs> do you do you do you do you do you need a bow tie to be a physicist? Hmm. <laughs> I think I've been asked this question before, but I can't remember where. Because it's every from. time we see you, every time we see you, always in your bow tie. I've never seen you in your in your in, in a necktie before. You don't need a bow tie to be a physicist because <laughs> now I'm wearing a necktie and I'm still a physicist. Anyway, um, you don't need a bow tie or a fancy dress or a tuxedo or even to live in rich, fancy conditions with some random black carpet and uh, behind you. It's not a black carpet. <laughs> anyway, you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be like some fancy guy in order to be a physicist. Anybody in the world can be a physicist. Anybody can be inspired to be a physicist and look out at every single thing and say, I wonder how this works. And that's one of the most important things. Everybody can be a physicist. Everybody should be a physicist, not just the people with neckties and bow ties. <laughs> that, 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 that is, um, yeah, cool. thank you for clarifying that for everybody. Um, I, I, I saw that you received a recognition from President Obama. Could you tell us more about that? So, uh, my recognition from President Obama, um, I, he wrote a letter to me on November 2nd, 2016. And I received it in the mail in, on November 10th, 2016. When I saw it, I was in shock because it was such an honor to receive that letter. And more so from the standing president of the United States. It really just struck me as like one of the most unusual things I had ever seen. Why would the U.S. president, the most powerful person in the world, the leader of the free world of all things, recognize some little, um, I was four at the time, to recognize some little four-year-old Asian American child named Saborno Isaac Berry that was just doing some random math at the time. I was so amazed that that happened and it was honestly such a great experience for me in fact i was so touched even by the way he wrote the letter it was short concise but still one second. Short it, was, it was such a great experience and i loved it i really uh, i really cannot say that it was not one of the most memorable experiences in my life so I want to see if there another one that, that that so you were also awarded the Da Vinci Lorette, the social architect recognition at the Da Vinci Institute for Technology and Management in South Africa last year. Why do you why do you think you're so smart? Uh first it's Laureate, but second appreciate it. That's why you're smart, you know, Laureate. Yeah, so that's why I I I, I figured I messed that up. <laughs> anyway, um First of all, about the Da Vinci Laureate, no, uh, the Da Vinci Laureate Award, I was so honored to receive it. And the moment I saw the invitation, I was like shocked. I hadn't received an invitation to anywhere in months, and all. And so I was so excited just to receive that letter, and it was honestly the most ex uh, amazing experience I had since the beginning of my life. And so it was the most memorable experience I had in my life, especially the speech that I gave in front of 20 PhD students. I had, I had to stand up. I had to do, cur I had to give myself courage. But the thing was, I didn't even follow a script. And the thing is, you have to use passion in those times. And passion is one of the most important things that you need to have. Second of all, you asked, why do you think I'm so smart? Uh, hmm. I can't remember where that question came from either. 
maybe possibly came from the same question came from the same sources that both I think. Hmm. <laughs> I think I'm so smart because I think I can solve uh, I don't know math, physics, chemistry problems uh, faster than hmm, any normal nine-year-old chilling in a fourth-grade classroom could. You know, you know, you know, Professor. While you were in uh, South Africa, we we have a clip to to um, support this. But you, I think you said that we need to look at the state of our education how it's failing our kids in general or something to that, uh, that, that effect up. But you mentioned that our education system is fundamentally broken because we do not teach our students the art of being creative. We do not teach our students to be imaginative. Uh, Neil, we have a clip on that, do we? get a good education from their school because their teachers are not passionate but rather people who are either in it for the money or just because uh, they uh, have nothing else to do and so the thing is this kind of uh, those kind of teachers uh, who are not passionate but rather are only doing it for the uh, money don't work really that well with their students they don't really work with the students and they don't really uh, practice with the equations they don't really know what they're talking about all they know is the equations the material they're talking about not really actually the whole thing the entire idea the whole branch of ideas of what they're talking about and so i thought uh, it's actually really hard to get a really good engaging teacher who can not only teach you the basic ideas and facts and complicated systems that are math and science and the part that school does show you but also the imaginative, experimentative, and discovery sec uh, fueled sector of, uh, well, math and science. Well, Barry is... All right, uh, Professor, wow. Break that down for me, please, sir, if you will. Uh, well, well, explain that, please. First of all, there are probably more relays in those few sentences than episodes in uh, your entire series. But second of all, um, I would like to think, I would like to say that education is broken at the seams because not only do we not teach our children to be a good sportsman uh, or good sportsmen, we don't teach our children to have respect for others. We don't uh, teach our children to have empathy for others because we don't teach our children to have those qualities some of them go on to become people who ravage the world selfishness mm. crim uh, crimes war crimes and so much more and so there are people <clears throat> there are people like hitler uh, philippe Pétain, joseph Mengele, osama bin laden all of these people who have done bad things to the world because we didn't teach them to be empathetic to one another. We didn't teach Osama to be empathetic to Americans in the West. We didn't teach Hitler to be empathetic to the people who are not Germanic, the Jews. We didn't teach them to be empathetic with the minorities. To be fair, G uh, Germany was in a horrible state of economics at that time. But still, that doesn't excuse hatred for other minorities and other peoples. We should teach our children to have education. That should uh, to teach uh, have empathy. That should be in the roots of our education. So that something like that can never happen again. And so, also, imagination. The reason we get, the reason that we don't have more breakthroughs, more Einsteins, more Newtons, more Faradays, more whatever revolutionary scientists you can name, like Tesla, um, Bohr, who knows. The reason we don't have those people is because we don't teach our children to be imaginative, to think outside of the box. And often, instead of showing our lesson, to our students, we tell it to them right in their face. They don't appreciate the lesson, but it's that way. They don't appreciate that. They don't get to see the full scope. We need to have something hands-on. And sure, for science, they already do that a lot. But mathematics, most times, it's never hands-on. Not in first grade, not in second grade, not in third grade, not in fourth grade, not all the way to 12th grade. We we don't have innovative minds in math because we don't have 
teachers who can introduce the, these concepts to the students in a way that they will understand visually, mentally, and in a hands-on sort of way. So, so what's your thought on standardized tests then? Because a lot of times these teachers are teaching to the curriculum because mm -hmm. the students at the end of the year have to pass a test. Um, and so what, just what is your initial thought on standardized tests and are they uh, the best way to determine intelligence or to test a uh, subject matter? Hmm. Well, the most of the time, the culprit for that is either the Regents exam or the SAT, as it's described in some books, the slimy, atrocious torture. But still, um, the Regents and SAT, most of the time, even uh, most of the time, you hear teachers saying, this isn't important because it's not in the Regents exam. So we'll skip over an entire chunk of mm. what you need to understand this whole lesson because it won't be tested on. And so if we have teachers like that, not preparing the students for the outside world or the field, just preparing them for the Regents exam in that field, it's not a matter of intelligence anymore. So it's a measurement of how good you are in memorizing something, how big your hippocampus is. It's not a test of your intelligence, your strength, your ability to solve puzzles anymore. And even IQ tests have been described to be flawed by some. But I think that that is the best way to measure one's intelligence because it actually solves puzzles. There's no training beforehand to show that you need to do this, you need to learn that, just so you can prepare for the IQ test. But it's not that way with the Regents and the SAT. Often, teach, uh, often, as I just said, teachers skip over entire concepts for the purpose of keeping the curriculum short and for preparing the students not for the field, but for the Regents in that field or the SAT section in that field. So we can't have that anymore because that doesn't prepare students for the real world. Prepare you know, students for the text they'll be taking next year or the year after that. Very well said. Professor, for years, uh, academic institutions have been paying big bucks to find out the, the, the cure, if you will, to solving this broken education system. Can you help us? What do you think? How can we fix this broken system that we have? Teach children to think outside of the box, teach children in a hands-on sort of way. Often, when you're teaching mathematics, you can't really find, uh, it's really hard to find a way to do something, uh, to do something hands-on. But that's not always the case. On, in the case of websites like, for example, Brilliant, um, totally not sponsored, um, in the case of websites like Brilliant, they make everything hands-on, even from a digital perspective. If they're doing it from a completely digital website, where the people who create that website aren't interacting with the students at all, then how do we have teachers in person that are always 24-7 interacting with the students that teach hundreds of times worse than that. We need hands-on. We need hands-on explanations for every single concept. But the thing is, it just takes time to do that. And many people aren't patient, especially not many school boards or college I, boards. I, and I, so, heard, I heard you're also an author. I heard you authored two books. Can you, can you tell us about them? Uh, my two books, yes. Uh, my first book was The Love, and The Love was a book I wrote in 2016, uh, a book that I started writing in 2016, finished in 2018. Uh, cut me some slack, I was a four-year-old. But I was inspired to start writing it when, uh, on July 3rd, 2016, I went into the mosque, it was just like usual, but that time, I asked the imam to pray for the USA because it was the eve of the 4th of July, Independence Day for the U.S. However, the imam st sternly yelled, no, and sued me out of the mosque. And so, um, from then on, I was inspired to write not only about Islamophobia, the phobia that comes from others about Islam, especially the U.S. Uh, a, but also what happens the reverse and the reverse 
American phobia. I mean, just look at what's happening in Iran, Iraq, and I know the U.S. has not、uh, has done some particularly not good things to make the Middle East a dumpster fire. But we don't need to hate every single American because of that.、We、need to have empathy for one another. Realize that one person doesn't represent all Americans. We need to realize that just because you don't like this American guy or that American guy, you don't have、uh, you have to you don't have to dislike the entire American population of three hundred fifty million people. And so that's what you have to、um, realize.、Uh, Um, many people in Islam are afraid of the West, and some have even taken to doing things like like the Mujahideen, or、uh, which is now known as the Taliban, ISIS, or、um, that terrorist、uh, Boko Haram, who have w- went and created dictatorships and regimes in order to try and stop the West from dominating their culture, dom- dominating their religion, and erasing them. They're creating this false mindset of we versus them, and we need to stop that. That's you know, what Professor I Jones, love. Professor Jones,、uh, you heard earlier some of the awards that this、uh, the Professor Barry has has、um, been bestowed. I should add that the the that, that was one the prestigious honor you heard earlier was one of many that he has been given since the age of five. Professor, if you will, what's a typical day like? For you, you wake up in the morning, and、uh, and what you 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 go to the office, or do you go to school, or what what what's your day like? Uh, my day is、hmm, my day starts out when I wake up, obviously, at around the six thirty in the morning. Of course, I get ready for school. I go to school. My school lasts until about two、uh, thirty, at which point I go back home, and then I bike for thirty minutes, and、um, then I take a nap, and after that, I start studying and working. And so,、um, the first thing I do is I usually、um, work on preparing for videos, like I don't know the daily or half daily videos that we do every single day on Very Side Slab. And、um, I, after that, I usually prepare for bigger endeavors than just、uh, I don't know preparing for Very Side Slab videos. I also carry out things like, I mean, I also carry out things like. Um, studying about、uh, studying the theory of everything, trying to get、uh, closer to quantum gravity, and then finally,、uh, I also have dinner, and then I go to sleep.、Uh, we got a, a few more questions for you. That's coming in, Professor. One of them says,、uh, "With with your hectic schedule, somehow,、uh, you know, you always have to make a way out.、Uh, how do you make your dreams come true, and、uh, what's the secret to your success?" What's the secret to my success? Well, the secret to my success is that I am inspired to do what I do. I am inspired to do math, and I think that everybody should be inspired to do math. I think that even the youngest child should think: Why does this object drop? Why is this fluid so viscous? Why is it so? Why is this thing so smooth? Why is this? Why does this ball, when rolled on one surface, go for longer than if it's rolled from the other surface? We need、uh, all people, young and old, to start wondering about physics. It's never too late to start thinking about math and physics. And what's more, I've even seen stories, some of them on my own channel, about people, my people being in. Sp- People hating math after they、um, get out of university, and then when they're forty or fifty, they get back into、um, math and science, and that's what we need. We need everybody. So,、uh, so I have to ask: Do do you have a driver's license? You know how how do you get around? Do you have a driver? How how do you get around? Um. Well, I'm nine, and U.S. state law says that I have to be 16 in order to drive, and、um, I'm not 16 yet, so、um, sad. And unfortunately, I can't change law yet because I'm not a member of the Senate. The government is messed up. Wait, 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 wait. Two things, Professor. What do you do for fun? And I think I read recently that you were trying to run、mm-hmm. for office in California. Am I correct? Uh well I do I am 
uh, the honorary mayor of a city in California named Paris. And I'm also uh, the honorary mayor of a Bangladeshi community in Los Angeles called named Little Bangladesh. So I have two badges for that over there. And I also met the mayor of Los Angeles. Well, not in person because apparently he wasn't able to attend. But I met one of uh, uh, his spokeswomen. So it was uh, quite a a fun experience. And I have, in fact, received some honorary positions in offices in uh, in California. Uh, Yeah, what do you do for fun? A question just came in. What do you do for fun? Um... Math that has no real purpose, um, like here. Math. math that have no real purpose. I mean, you don't really have to. Uh, you don't really have to have a purpose to do math. Math is fun, you know. Um, there are some people who think it isn't, but I don't know. Maybe they're not math guys. Uh, professor. I don't have the authority to do this, but I have one of my board members here with me, and I'm I'm going to ask him right now. Sarge, I would love to make this young man honorable member of KOP. Can we confer that on him right now? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Professor KOP is a mentoring program. We've been we've been providing knowledge and opportunities to young people so they can be prosperous for 31 years. This is our approaching our 31st year in this community, and we work with young people like yourself to prepare them for life in, 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 in this, our global society. So I'm gonna have Sergeant uh, Oscar uh, Leon confer the the honor, if you will, of being an honorable member of KOP, Sarge. Congratulations, Professor. You Thank are you now so an honorary much. member of KOP. <laughs> now, 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 Sarge, last question I have for you, if you will, you do a lot of speeches and we heard it earlier, but do you do you still get butterflies? Are you nervous when you do your speeches? Sometimes when I'm giving it in front of a big crowd, of course I have butterflies in my stomach. Just natural, you know. When uh, public speaking sometimes is easy, sometimes it's hard. And sometimes, especially when you're, you're in front of 20 people who just received a PhD, you have no script at all, totally not referencing one of my own experiences, you get just a teensy bit nervous. Uh, last question just came in. I have to let you go, Sarge. Uh, no, Sarge uh, excuse me, Professor. A lot question just came in. You received a recognition from the president of Harvard University. What was that like? Mm, president Drew Foss of Harvard University. I was so honored to receive a letter from her. And it gave me the same shock. In this, uh, and it also gave me a little bit of nostalgia from that letter in 2016 that I received from President Barack Obama. And it was such a big achievement for me. Imagine getting a letter from the leader of the most prestigious institution and the one with the most Nobel Prizes by a landslide. The, uh, the second, uh, the second, which is by far, um, is Cambridge University, which has uh, many less Nobel Prizes. And so receiving, uh, receiving that kind of award from such a prestigious institution, it really just gave me so much. I can't describe the feeling that it gave me, but it gave me so much honor and it gave me so much joy. And I was honestly, uh, I just fell over when I read the letter, especially when I Googled who Drew Faust was and I saw it was the Harvard president. Professor, I got to get this in. How do you relax? Someone just asked, how does he relax? What do you do for fun? Um, I do for relaxation. What I do for relaxation is I do mathematics. I also um, try to be empathetic myself, read some holy books. And uh, lastly, for fun, I brush my teeth. Okay, I'm just kidding on that one. But for fun, I also do mathematics and I wonder about physics. I wonder about stuff like that. And sometimes I try to um, teach myself new things. Like I want to teach myself about quantum mechanics, um, quantum physics, and possibly get towards quantum gravity. Professor, anything you want to say in closing before you go, sir? Good night, Bobby, that's our side, but we gotta go. Wait till you got a chance.
Good night, sweetheart. Go ahead. It's time to go. Professor, anything, any closing thoughts before you go, sir? The last thing I would like to say in closing is in closing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <laughs> I hear you heard it. That was professional. I really must. What's going on over the weekend, brother? 